What if two incredibly handsome men had a podcast where they talked about the Marvel Cinematic Universe? What would that universe be like, Ryan? Oh, my God. Actually, let me ask you. Let me put it this way. <clears throat> what if two ridiculously handsome men started a idea where they would convey their passion about Marvel? But what if that was led by Ryan, not Andrew? I think if that happened, then we would probably be streaming ga- like Marvel games and then talking about Marvel games. I think that's that's like our what if show, you know, if we if it was me who started the idea, it would have been streaming and gaming and talk about Marvel stuff that way, which, again, we could always do at some point in time. But that's our like what if moment. That's 100 percent what would happen. And then in like the the 20th episode of that show, one of us would be like, you know, it'd be cool if we did this for like the Marvel movies. i know right i would i actually i would love to stream the movies and then like do the live commentary over it but because of the digital world we live in they won't there's no way anyone would let you do it i don't think there is yeah with the rights issues and everything right yeah it's it's weird we did a, a stream not a stream but on rebel scum podcast one time we did a commentary of the force awakens and i think what we just ended up doing was The easiest way to do it is just tell everybody like, okay, guys, we can't show you the movie, but we're pressing play now. And then everybody just kind of gets involved. Because guaranteed, everybody who listens to this owns a like a Blu-ray of, you know, Iron Man. So we're good. Or has has Disney Plus at this point. But yeah, no, I I agree. I think that then you would do like a Discord chat and do the, you know, you could set it up that way. But yeah, I hear you. It would be fun to just stream it on like Twitch, for example, and then just bring people in. I think that would be fun. But yeah, that's that's kind of like our what if moment. What if? Well, what if you were listening to Infinity Rewatch with Andrew Fantasia and Ryan J. Whitehead? Oh, psych, you don't have to ask because that's what you're doing. You're doing Ooh. that right now. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I Oh, man, this show. You know, I had mixed feelings about this show. I was very optimistic to watch it. Um, but at the same time, I was cautious because this, the animated side of things, you know, you never know, right? You just, you never know if it's going to meet the same tone the MCU is going to deliver on. You know what I mean? Like we know MCU movies, we know what tone they're going to set, uh, right out of the gate. doesn't matter which hero it is. You know that it's going to do something for the MCU, but when it's animated, it changes the narrative. It changes the the feel. It's there's so many variables that change the overall structure of of doing a traditional movie. So that brings a lot of mixed feelings for me. I I wasn't sure about it, but I was not disappointed. That's the key here. I don't know about you, Fantasia, but I was definitely not disappointed. No, neither was I. And I was in the same boat. I was like, okay, I understand this has to be animated because it's not even, you know, canon. It's just like a fun side thing. So that's fine. You don't need to, you know. But it is canon. It's all canon. It's all canon. Yeah. With the multiverse and everything. And yeah, you're right. It's like, it's, it's just this, because it's so tangential, it didn't have to be, you know, we need to get Haley Atwell in front of a camera and put her in the costume. Like, they can be more, more a little like loose with it. And I was like, all right, this will be fun. But I wasn't like, Oh my God, I can't wait. You know, not, not the way I was for like WandaVision or something. And uh, it was that sort of, you're right. There, there's the sort of stigma that comes with the fact that it is animated. And typically you and I don't have that stigma. We love cartoons. Like we, yeah. when we met the day we met, we bonded over cartoons for like 40 hours. <laughs> They, yeah. were, they were trying to tell us what our curriculum in college was going to be. And we were just like, you remember Biker Mice from Mars? But, so, <laughs> like, clearly, like, yeah, like even during the whole orientation, we we're just like, have you seen Captain Planet? <laughs> 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 so, Which episode was your favorite? And I, I, I'm actually not going to lie to you guys. Instant messaging was a big thing for us. And uh, during some classes, we probably shouldn't have been doing it. We were group message chatting each other the entire time. Oh my God. We were, that was, I don't know how we passed the college course. But we yeah. Did. We found yeah. it. 
Um, but the the whole idea of like this is a cartoon. It, I don't know. It was you're right. It was this weird little thing where it's like, okay, is this going to be a cartoon like Star Wars Clone Wars? Like, yeah. Or is this going to be a cartoon like Star Wars Resistance? Like, hmm. Right. So we we kind of we had no idea what to expect. Marvel had never done this before. Um, the whole idea of Marvel going multimedia really, or rather the MCU going multimedia wasn't even really ever in the cards. Mm -hmm. Um, Except you remember before infinity war, I don't even know if it ever happened, but there was supposed to be a novel that was the backstory of Thanos. And that, I don't think it ever came out. Do you remember that? Yeah, I don't. I remember hearing about it, but they never, I remember never seeing anything on it. Yeah. And I'm, it wasn't, you know, a big, blow i was like oh shit they didn't put the thanos book out uh because it because of the nature of the mcu because it's already a spin-off of what these comics are i don't feel the need to expand the mcu story in a multimedia way like i don't feel yeah. i don't want an mcu video game if they're gonna make a marvel video game give me something like ultimate alliance right so keeping the story where it was i've always been content with so now along comes this cartoon and i'm like okay sure but what's this going to mean for me how is this going to make me excited and it comes out we're two episodes in uh and it it's it's doing the trick and i think after the first episode i was like i was still like all right this is cool it's groovy but you know i'm not gonna you know i'm not counting down the days like i was with loki after episode two i'm like this is a really fun show (laughs) i you know okay so let me let's 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 rewind here a little bit Mm. i first of all i love that like i think that's a great closing note on on our initial thoughts of this um and let's 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 really break it down here so i'm going to break down now my initial thoughts going into the first episode like we've talked about the overall but let's talk about going into the episode so for me what really blew my mind first was I was a little bit awkward about the animation, but once you see the animation actually play out as opposed to the trailer, because you see the trailer jump from so many different episodes, but when you see the animation play out in one episode, it's a really elevated form of Disney animation. And I'm, I'm talking like, I guys, I'm talking like the old school animated stuff, like your Hercules, Aladdin. This is the, the high evolutionary form of, I see what you see what did, did there. <laughs> see what it did? And this is this is the high evolutionary form of that animation, which is really cool. I I I am usually opposed to when Disney does a 3D movie these days because I'm like, man, this was like the hey, the hand drawn stuff. This would be really cool. And don't get me wrong, your Moanas, your all that stuff, it's fantastic. But let's face it, like for me, I will still go back to Princess and the Frog. Yes. <laughs> because that was a true nod to the original animation. And it was amazing to see how that still played out. And and like if I were to tell you guys like my new favorite Disney 3D one, the only one so far to really kind of carry the torch that um, the old Disney movies did was Tangled. Uh, and just because the, the hero, the way the hero was designed um with Finn and everything it just it just kind of fit the the same style um but in terms of the animation it's just not the same and when Princess the Frog came out I was like man they should this just proves that they should just do hand-drawn stuff through and through and now when you look at this Marvel stuff it is kind of like a 2.5d animation like I can't really it's not 3d um but it's not 2d either and and it's gorgeous my god the, some, of the, some of the smoothest animation I've ever seen. And when I say that, I mean, like, all the fight scenes are fully played out. There's no jump cuts, like, no jump cuts during moves. It's, like, one fluid movement sequence, and it looks beautiful to watch. So that won me over instantly. And I was like, okay, the show is now, like, I can now accept watching it. And I was excited because I'm like, oh, my God, it's like, and that's this is the kind of moment I, I I wrote it down too, and I wanted I want to say it on here in the words that I wrote it down in, which is this is as if Disney did a Marvel movie. You know what I mean? Like Ooh. let's say let's say Marvel wasn't a partnership of Disney, but like everyone's buying rights and doing everything. This is that result. This is if Disney went to Marvel and said we're going to make a movie. 
this is what it would look like. Yeah, I like that, man. It, it, it's You're right. It's like 2.5D. Uh, I've mentioned Star Wars Resistance. I think Resistance was the exact same animation style. I wish I knew what it was called. I should have asked my cousin because he's an animator. Mm-hmm. He would know exactly what it's called. But uh, it, yeah, it's very smooth. Uh, it somehow it manages to be like minimalist. It's not as detailed as something like, you know, the Bad Batch, right? But at the same time, even though it's minimalist, the faces are so spot on. Like I'm looking at Yondu today. I'm like, that looks like Michael Rooker. Somehow, Mm -hmm. like maybe they got some pointers from the people who make Funko Pops, but somehow they managed to take like just a few minimal squiggly lines and make it look like a certain person. And that takes skill. So that was, I think that was a really, really cool animation choice. But I got a question for you because I was mulling this over and I still don't know. I still feel like, I would have liked this. And it's because the whole idea of you're right, this is canon. And apparently what happens in what if is going to be important in the grand scheme of the MCU from what we've heard. I thought when I kind of heard that, I thought that the way the show was going to be laid out was we would get a live action watcher. And then when he tells us the stories, it would go to the, the cartoon and maybe we'll still get that because we've only really seen the watcher like, hey, there's a silhouette. Uh, but what do you think? Do you think that would work? To be fair, we have seen a, a live version of the watcher. We have. Yeah. But I mean, like, take that from Guardians and like put that in this. So it's like yeah. it looks like that's the real world. And he's telling us here's what the multiverse is looking like. Uh Okay, I think I see. I think I see how you're trying to lay it on me here. I, mm-hmm. I think I've got it interpreted. Um, yeah, I, I would have liked to have seen that, but at the same time, I kind of like the way they because I think the problem is it would have felt disconnected had you done it live action and then like you kind of like zoom into his brain and and see wow. what it like what he's seeing. So I think in order to keep the continuity. Eh, uh, look at me using those big film words. Continuity <laughs> to to create like a good flow. I think that's what you, I think that's why it's a very, but I, I personally, me, I love what they did. And you know what, actually, uh, you know what? I see why you say that. And here's how I would have done it if I were in your shoes or if I were in the director's shoes and I wanted to do that. They should have done it like Star Wars where you see this, the, the starry galaxy sky and then you see the silhouette, a 3D silhouette of Uatu, which is like the iconic way to introduce uh, Uatu. And then as, as it drifts off, like as you go from like the real space, it slowly transitions into animated and then it cuts down to the real world. I think, I think that's kind of as, as someone who understands your, your love for Star Wars and uh, not only that, but just like as a Disney whole, be, knowing that they have the Star Wars brand, I would have, that's my approach. That's how I would have done it. Yeah. You, you're speaking my language, buddy. That's because mm-hmm. like, I'm just, that's like the idea of that watcher, just Uatu, how he, how he looked in Guardians, even if none of those guys were him, whatever, just like the live action. And I put quotes around live action because the watchers were CGI even back then. But just the live action Uatu saying his thing like you're saying. And then, yeah, you pan, you see those stars. And then when you pan down to a planet or whatever, whoops, it's a cartoon. And it fits. It doesn't feel yeah. jarring that way. Uh, and I still think I would like to see that. And I still think the opportunity is not lost for us to see that. I still think they I- might do something. Like, I don't think every one of these episodes is going to be the exact same formula of like, Here's his silhouette, and now here's the. I think it might get a bit. We'll see more and more of Uatu as it goes on, maybe to the point where he says in the last episode something along the lines of, I'm telling you guys these stories for a reason, and here's the reason. I'm Jeffrey Wright. And then. You could be right. I mean, we don't don't speak in the. the world of speculation here, but there's some pretty hefty talks right now about secret wars that it is, it is going that direction and which is, yeah, I'm doing a little dance of joy. Yeah. yeah. 
Hey, dance of joy. Um, and I actually, listeners, you guys should be dancing for doing your dance of joy because if that's true, then Uatu would be the perfect person to kick it off because mm-hmm. he's the only one that's going to see it coming. And he, uh, in fact, any sort of Secret Wars adaptation I've seen on a multimedia side of things outside of comics, Uatu kicks it off. Um, he, uh, you know, if you look at Marvel Heroes, it's kind of it's kind of like a Secret Wars start uh, where it kicks off with um, uh uh, it kicks off with Uatu with this brilliant opening monologue for Uatu the Watcher, and it, it it's animated and it's just it's absolutely gorgeous. My favorite of all time. If you're gonna watch it, make sure you watch the original Marvel Heroes opening cinematic. Don't watch the console ones, and I'll tell you why. Because they took out the Fantastic Four per- portion of it because that was during the legal battle, so you don't get to see the Fantastic Four segment in it. But in the original, before this huge legal battle of Fantastic Four nonsense, um, they actually have like he talks about how he's seen explorers, you know, turn into you know. He says like he says like he, he says every person's personality is like an evolution, right? And he talks about I can't remember how he says it, but he's like I've seen adversity turn into purpose. I've seen you know accident turn into this, um, and it's a beautiful speech. But my point is, in the end, he's seen. I, he says I've seen all these things, and I vow never to interfere. But you, Doctor Doom, has now you you forced my hand and have now made me interfere and then doom like attacks him. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, and this isn't the first time they've done it. Marvel ultimate Alliance. They did the exact same thing. And Uatu does the whole, you know, I am the watcher. I watch things and I, I'm told not to interfere because the first time he did, that's what happened when the infinity stones got introduced and that caused a whole lot of problems. Um, but that's a whole thing. So, uh, so it's very possible that Uatu, uh, the end of what if could mean the beginning of the, the storyline to secret wars. There you go. There you go. Uatu, you he, go. he knows it all. He knows it all. And he's going to, the next episode, mark my words, is going to be called what if Christine Everhart wasn't a nihilist. Uh, and Uatu is- He's just gonna be like, "This is ridiculous," because we all know she is. But uh, I'll, I guess I'll show you what that world would be like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do we? Do we know she is? Because I'm pretty sure we don't. If that happens, I'm FaceTiming you, and I'm just gonna scream on camera for a full hour. <laughs> even if it's like, even if it like, I don't know, if Nihilus just does like shape shifting ability and appears as Christine just for like a second, I'll, I will be. I will. I don't know what I will do. I just <laughs> I'll slap you just because it's, just cause. <laughs> it's a slap of respect. It's the slap yes. of respect in terms of like, damn the fact that you were right, but I'm going to slap you anyway because yeah. you were right. It's like when you say, you beautiful son of a bitch. <laughs> it's yeah. that kind of slap. So mm-hmm. tell me, Ryan, how you feel about the fact that the person who is, in my opinion, the most beautiful woman in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Peggy Carter, is now Captain Carter. The Captain Carter. British uh, soldier. Of, I don't even know what her term is. is. She just called Captain Britain now. I don't know. But why do you feel about the fact that she got that serum instead of Stevie? Uh, okay. So I thought, because like, here's the, th- here's the tricky thing about what if, and this is, again, this is where hesitation comes into play, is like the pattern. The second I start sensing a pattern, I'm going to be upset because then it's predictable. Mm -hmm. And I was a little worried with the whole, you know, what if Steve wasn't Cap and who would take his place and then Peggy Carter and it's a whole thing. But the trick is, the trick is that makes me really enjoy it is the meaning behind the change, right? Um, That is really where the gem of the story comes into play. And it was done beautifully in the second episode. Yeah. To keep in mind. Um, and so, so, okay. So, uh, I, at first I was a little bit hesitant, but I actually really enjoyed it. And, and you have to remember during the whole story here, this is Disney's interpretation of a Marvel story. So of course it's going to be a little more pump you full of happiness than, than normally a MCU movie would. 
MCU movies do have optimistic outcomes, but there's still realistic tones that they throw in there to give it a sort of gravity to it, where I feel like this is because it's this wonderful, magical world of what if, um, they kind of make it feel more comic booky and more optimistic. It's, you know, uh, it's, it's funny that they don't do the, the song and dance routine that Cap actually does in the movie, but uh, it's, it's, it worked. It, it worked, in my opinion, because I, I think what I love about it is, I mean, uh, Disney also doesn't pull any punches for the script writing. Like, uh, Peggy takes the serum and they're just calling her out. Like, you know, I wanted a soldier and I got, all I got was a girl. Like, oh. those were savage lines. Like, I thought they were going to be a little more like, all I got was you. Like, like something like that. But the fact that they just kept like really playing up the girl thing i was like wow you are going there and and it was it was fun it was really fun and it, i think because of the half an hour window things did kind of pick 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 up pace really quickly but the whole idea is is like it picks up pace to transition to certain points because once you get to certain events like uh her becoming captain carter uh physically to her becoming captain carter you know politically and then resolution kind of thing um what what is the result of that and that's the key for me here is the result of captain carter in this uh in my honest opinion uh is i i think they this is that i'm starting to realize that marvel seems to do this thing where they don't say it because they know you're going to just jump to that conclusion super quickly. And that conclusion is, is they're saying she's Captain Britain. They're essentially like flat out saying Captain Britain uh, <laughs> with Captain. And uh, if you read the 2000s run of Captain Britain, they actually become the guardians of the multiverse. Uh, and there's actually a Captain Britain core. And they all protect the multiverse and there's different versions of Captain Britain. Um, so I think that this is Marvel saying we, and there is a lot of controversy with this too, but this is, this is uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe saying she's Captain Britain. We're just not going to call it out because uh, maybe we have other plans and we want to reveal Captain Britain as like a bigger thing. Yeah. It was like, cause they haven't gotten to Captain Britain yet. So it would be weird for them to kind of say like, oh, this usurps that when they never told us that to begin with. Yeah, so I'm glad they didn't call that much attention to it. And I'm glad they didn't tap dance around the the feminism thing because mm -hmm. look, it's 1942 or whatever. It's these people are going to be dicks because that's how men were back then, especially in the military. And I love that they created that bit of adversity uh, as another hurdle for Peggy. Like I, I, I like Captain Marvel, the movie, and I think it's great and it's fun. But I remember hearing somebody say this. I'm like, yeah, that's a good point where they said, you know, they, there were a lot of moments in that movie that were trying to tell the audience, like, look, what, look, she, look what she can do. She's overcoming all the men, girl power. And it's like, yeah, great. She's awesome. But the movie itself never made how did they phrase it? Her character, as she is like on the Cree planet or whatever, before, you know, we see her get to earth, never had to deal with sexism that we saw. And then at the end, they're like, look at her. She's fighting back against the sex. It's like, yeah, but that was, that was the movie never established that as a problem. It's a problem in real life, a hundred percent. And you are addressing that real life problem, but you're addressing it in a story where that problem never showed its face. Right. Uh, so mm. it, it was sending weird mixed signals to us. Uh, but with Peggy Carter, they made that apparent right away. And what I also like is that they, you know, she took care of it right away. Like that guy was always around, but she was always standing up to him. Everybody else was standing up to him too. Like everybody's like, yeah, this guy's a dick. And it, it it became just this thing that's there because it fits the period. And if it wasn't there in that period, I think we would have all noticed and we would have been like, it feels like you're leaving it out because you're trying to be cuddly, Disney. And yeah. you know, don't patronize us, please. We can take it. We, we're, we're big kids. We can take it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so I like that they 
put that there and they, they had Peggy be like, screw you, pal, uh, because that's exactly what she needs to be. She's our hero. And I think we ended up with a really cool Captain Carter. And I, you know me, any excuse to see more Peggy, I'm happy. So I, I love that uh, that we got this. And it was really funny to see her towering over Steve. <laughs> she's like this huge hulking like action figure. And she's just like, hey, Peggy, how's it going? It's funny you bring that up, too, because Isabella um, and uh, Anna, who you guys know as a guest on this show, um, uh, Isabella was pointing out that that she loves that they still committed to the love story they had. Even though she was super powered, he still loved her and she loved him. You know what I mean? Even though she was the more powerful individual, it actually speaks volumes. Yes. Um, and and it was beautifully done. It was, oh man, it was, it was gorgeous. Uh, and it worked out really well. And again, it was a risky play. It was a risky play. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. I just mean like, like go good job guys like way to just go out there and just tell it like it is you know what i mean um uh you know way to not be afraid i think is the, is the kind of language i'm using exactly. um but yeah it, it was it was yeah i love how you brought that up that she's like she, physically she's bigger than him um and and uh, more way more powerful than he is but the the relationship between them that he still respects her and he also loves her is is a beautiful story can you imagine oh. this would have been super problematic and I I'm glad they didn't do it. But can you imagine like they just totally reverse the scene where like she comes out of the thing and he's so impressed by her. He touches her chest for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I was like, Oh man, there was a moment where I was like, Oh man, are they going to do that? That'd be kind of, <laughs> kind of weird. Uh, but, but they did it really well. I mean, again, I like, I, I was wondering how they're going to do the switch Mm -hmm. And I like that it like it was the decision of her to stay, which caused like the whole series of events. I love that. Um, and and not only that, it, it she was catching on to the guy. The guy blows the blows it up, and uh, yeah, it it was just it was beautifully done. And uh, and 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 the other thing I have to mention that first of all, a lot of people were saying like, oh, she's the new Captain America. Why are they getting rid of Sam and all this stuff? And I'm like, guys, like. Like, what if his canon? Yes, but it doesn't mean that they're replacing characters because of what's happening in What If. That's not. That's not it at all. Like that's it, the title literally says this is just a hypothetical question. <laughs> I know. Like they, the there was a small movement where people were like they're replacing Spider Man. The voice is different. I'm like, I'm like, it's it's not. <laughs> it's, wow. it's the multiverse, guys. Let it go. Just like let. I, I know the whole Tom Holland thing was kind of like in, uh, like uh, unstable for a bit there, but uh, don't worry about the instability. Like, what if is the? It's a hypothetical, like you said. It's so beautifully said. Um, so yeah, but people were genuinely upset, and at the wow. same time, I'm like, she's not Captain America. If they were establishing that narrative, they would. They, to my point, they would have said she's Captain Britain right out of the gate, which she is. But but it's that Marvel thing where they're they're. They're making you think a certain way because they're going to do something with that. And they want you to start getting to that direction. And remember, there are various versions of Captain Britain. Captain Britain looks very different um, in, in, various, in various comic series. And this is just another iteration, in my humble opinion. And they, they found a cool way to keep us sort of from getting I, I say confused and i don't know if that's the right word but clearly there are some people who are confused and who could have probably done with a quick google search before they flew off the handle but yeah. i like that in this episode we don't see it in the next one but in this episode we get a scene that is beat for beat from the movie where red skull shows up first and pulls up in his sexy car and takes the the cube to kind of let us know this is where we are in the story uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, it's kind of a signpost that's like, this is familiar. You know where you are, right? Okay, now we're going to deviate again. Uh, and we get to see some cool little things of like, when people have the cube, here's how they use it, both the good side and the bad. And that for me was my favorite part of this episode, because in that first movie, 
uh, it's arguably in all of the movies, we don't really get to see the cube used for its potential, uh, you know, until Loki's just like, you know, here's a stone, right? So that was a really neat treat to see them use it in such a way, the way Stark uses it. And it's very different than the way Red Skull uses it. Yeah, I actually, you know, it kind of, to me, reminded me of the Rogue One kind of plot thing, to be honest with you, because um, in Iron Man 2, it's established that uh, that Howard Stark um, said he was limited by by his time, like the technology of his time. And uh, in, in Captain America, the first one, they he was saying that um, he was he was testing the the cubes power and all that stuff but he only worked with samples never got to work with the whole thing so it's nice to see that kind of gap filled where it's like oh if he had the cube this is what he would have done which is building the iron man suit which it it explains a lot and it fills a nice gap there and but at the same time it also shows you had red skull taken more time he would have done something different right like he would have you know he can't build because he doesn't have zola he can't quite build what he originally designed. So he builds something else and he ends up, he does exactly what he does in the comic books, which is he summons, uh, he summons, I would say not exactly actually, but he does summon creatures from other worlds. And so he usually summons frost giants and the whole nine yards. But um, in this case, they summon something that people are still speculating today what it is. And I kind of agree where the comic book fans are going because I kind of, I, I totally, the evidence makes sense to me. It's Cthulhu, isn't it? Cthulhu is part of the MCU confirmed. No, no, no. But it is Marvel's version, essentially, of Cthulhu. Oh, wow. <laughs> His name is Shuma Goroth. Um, he That's is, a very Lovecraftian name. Yeah, uh, he. The best way to, f- to kind of see him in action is uh, if you play Marvel vs. Capcom Two. He was one of the characters you can play. Um, he's kind of like an octopus-looking thing. I think he was in Marvel vs. Capcom One too, uh, and I mean one as well as two. <laughs> uh, he was in. Um, yeah, he's in the first. I think he was in the first one as well. Uh, he's an interdimensional creature uh, who can cast dark magic, and he also has the ability to grow in size. Ooh. Mm-hmm. I think, let's play a quick round and never tell me the odds. Because I think the odds are good. I'm going to say 68% that we're going to see that same monster in Multiverse of Madness. Oh, you're not you're not the only one that's on that train, my friend. I think the, I think the comic book community is all there with you. Really? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got uh, so the first community, so shove it. A lot of the big, a lot of the big kind of like nerd sites, uh, more specifically like the Nerdists, they uh, they are uh, all betting the same thing that they're gonna. They're saying that they're saying that this could set up uh, seeing someone like Shuma Goroth, or yeah, seeing uh, Shuma Goroth. I can't pronounce it right. I'm pretty sure I'm totally butchering it, but I'm Dude, pretty it's sure it's a Lovecraft name. Nobody can pronounce it right. Not Shumagorath. <laughs> Shumagorath. Uh, he's a, uh, or Sumagorath. We're going to see more of that character in Multiverse Madness for sure. Yes. All right. And that's opening up the Cthulhu Cinematic Universe. It's going to happen. CCU mm. 2025. Let's go. Uh, yeah. I That was a really cool little treat. And again, just the whole idea of just because Peggy happened to get there a little bit earlier and get that the cube and bring it back to Stark, now Tony's life is completely different. Because now there's such yeah. thing as an Iron Man suit years before Tony's even conceived. So there, the ripple effect, right? And the Watu never really takes us down that road. You know, there's never really like an epilogue where it's like, yeah, because of this, you know, uh, Tony had a suit of iron when he was like 14 and he didn't use it right. And he crashed and hurt himself and he's crippled now. Like there's so many roads this could go down and we don't see that, but it's just, it's so implied. The minute I saw Stark show off that suit and be like, here you go, Steve. I was like, this, the whole world is, is different now. The whole yeah. world is different. 
So. And again, you kind of get to see epilogue wise what happens in the second episode, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so again, you kind of I, I again, Captain Carter was a good first episode. It I I wouldn't say it right out of the gate. I'm not going to say it's my favorite out of the series because first of all, not only have we not seen the other episodes, but just based on what I have seen on the previews, I don't think it's going to quite hit that that excitement that i will feel much later on um because i i know what i'm banking for and based on what i'm seeing it's it's going to be worth what i'm banking for so i i am very interested to see how this is going to play out but when i say it's my favorite episode no it's it's a good episode it's a good way to start it but i feel like they're they're holding back for a good reason I think they were again. I think it was a tame episode in comparison to other things that could happen. Oh yeah, well, even comparison to what follows, it was very tame. But it was a you're right. It's a good stepping stone. Get people warmed up to this idea. How many are we looking at here? What's the? Do they say a final count of like what this show is going to be? I think um, we're counting down to eight episodes. Eight episodes. Okay, eight's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think. I'm really curious because I don't know. These first two are the only ones that I knew about. I'm sure they've mm. they've said you know hints of what the other ones are, but I haven't heard those yet. So I'm really excited for that surprise. I think what's crazy is that we have eight episodes. We're on episode two, which means we got six weeks left, uh, which takes us into October, give okay. or take. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pretty two much, weeks yeah, into yeah, October. October, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then we get a two-week break, and then we get a Hawkeye right out of the gate. Woo-hoo. Well, during that two-week break, we've got a special episode planned. Yeah, very excited to do it. Uh-huh. Very excited to do it, guys. We're we're very. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, you guys just keep keep your ears open. Keep your ears. I can't even talk. You keep your ears open till October. Uh, but in the meantime, T'Challa is Star Lord. Who? Yes. Who? I, you know, and again, this is a good example of the Disney formula, man. This is uh, that character. What they did to him was priceless. <laughs> I have a new favorite Marvel character, and it's animated Korath the Pursuer. He yeah. <laughs> was everything for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he carried the, his comedy, man. Oh, man, that actor, his comedy was on point for that entire episode, and it never <laughs> missed a beat. It was so good. And the the fact that this episode was full of every actor, pretty much, I think, every actor in the MCU. I think Batista was the only one that they didn't get. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know why, but it really helped, uh, especially when a certain one shows up. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But what did you think of this overall premise? Uh, the, the man, T'Challa, becomes Star-Lord. Uh, two things. First of all, it goes without saying, it was really sad to see that this was Chadwick's last performance. Um, but, uh, he, again, it, it was just great to watch him do his thing, you know, it was, it was a great show and a, a great episode to really just kind of s- just him being in his element and just being the, the hero that we know him for. Um, to be fair on the, the content side of it, uh, I was a little bit nervous because for me, Guardians is great and all, but it's not my realm of uh, expertise with the Marvel stuff. I'm very hesitant with the Guardian stuff. And again, it's just, I don't know, maybe it's kind of, uh, I don't know. It's its kind of one of those things where I guess it's kind of, it's kind of, there's a rhythm to the Guardians movies right now. And it's a bit, it's a bit predictable now. It's getting a bit kind of the same, the same humor, the same jokes, but it kind of, they kind of play it up a bit. Um, but interesting enough, uh, no rocket or Groot, uh, which was interesting, uh, to point out. And, uh, the other side of this is overall, it, it got me, man, got me in the feels, uh, in an interesting way. Uh, not in like, uh, not in the heart, well, the heartfelt thing for the obvious reasons, but the, um, the, the good feels, the good feels in in the way they deliver this story. Um, so yeah, it was it it was surprising for me in a good way, and it was a lot better than I was I was ready to just go through this go through the paces with this one. But the story they ended up delivering on, I really loved it. 
Same, man. This one really gripped me. Uh, I felt with the Peggy Carter episode, it was like, here's the set piece at the beginning where she gets the serum. Here's the set piece at the end where they fight the octopus. And then everything in the middle, just it felt like it wasn't really a story so much as it was just a montage of stuff. Like, and now Mm -hmm. she's rescuing Bucky and now we're jumping to the train and now we're doing this. This episode, the Guardians one, just felt like a story for me to be um, it, with the conceit of, yes, T'Challa is Star-Lord now, but here's this tale that we're going to tell of him being Star-Lord. So it felt better written. And I think because of that, I was able to appreciate it more. And everything that just kind of uh, the the world that he inhabited, which is the Guardians world, but in this new light, really I, I just felt so good to be back there and i was just like yay i'm loving this so much and you take the super colorful world of guardians and the super colorful world of wakanda and you put them together and i'm just i'm pleased as punch i loved it i loved this episode a bunch yeah so so first of all I, what i love about this is uh the setup the setup takes place uh you know that <laughs> That um, Yondu uh, gives gives the task to his lackeys and just like go figure it out, guys. Go get me what I'm looking for, and they totally get it wrong. Like just absolute butchered the whole thing. But uh, you know the the curiosity of T'Challa was beautiful. Like it was a great story. Um, and not only that, the evolution of his curiosity, and I love how he's so like. His because he's so diplomatic, uh, how many things were able to be resolved because of how patient and how understanding he was, yeah. uh, was just such a joy to watch. And he gets his fame through that because of his ability to resolve all these big, complex things that he goes through. I loved it. Up to and including getting a certain mad titan to stop being so gosh darn mad. Yeah, dropping in Josh Brolin with uh with Thanos. Uh it was oh man, epic stuff. Uh whew. um <laughs> that was I, the one know. for me. That was the one where it's like I think you see you hear his voice and you see his hand on like somebody's shoulder, I think Korath's shoulder. But the minute I heard his voice, I'm like, it's Thanos. And because it's Josh Brolin's voice. And yeah. so that sold it for me. That sold me on this idea of like, yeah, if, if they had gotten just a voice actor to do a Thanos impression, that moment wouldn't have hit me as hard. But to mm-hmm. hear Josh Brolin talk as a good guy and be like, well, he he convinced me, whatever. And I'm just like, whoa, th- now this feels like a true what if story. You know yeah. I mean? He, and, and it's again this is marvel's way of speaking to the fans i've said this b- before many a times this is like those moments on screen when marvel's like yeah hey, hey, we're listening we're watching and uh, because one of the biggest debates of endgame and infinity war was was thanos right and mm-hmm. and when you have your audience to that level of engagement like that's that's what you want man you want them talking about it and people were. I heard so many things. I heard um, other big podcasts doing whole debates on on was he right? Is this the way to go? And does it work? And um, and a lot of people were were saying it doesn't because if you take out half of life randomly, you may actually upset the structure uh, of the ecosystem, and and the ecosystem may not be able to repair itself. So, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. And so there were, there were so many rooms of bait. And I love how in this, what if it's like, tall is like, no, you're wrong. And this is why. <laughs> yeah. He, he found a way around it. And now not only is Thanos not going about that, but he's totally a nice dude who doesn't torture his daughter. He's a in bro. Fact, he's-, he's a bro. And his daughter is smoking as a blonde. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they went for the they went for the '80s comic Nebula. Although I don't think she had the platinum blonde that uh, that this one had, but or is it, I guess it's not platinum blonde, just like super shiny blonde hair. Um, but it was just yeah, it was it was the the Nebula look. That's that's the hair. Uh, I love blonde Nebula. She's that that's a toy. That's got to be a toy. I think it will be for sure. Um, and 
Uh, I loved uh, the collectors of villain. That was awesome to see uh, that whole scene. And Howard the Duck uh, getting another cameo appearance. Absolutely epic. I feel like you definitely need to watch that whole sequence a few times because there may be things people missed. Um, kind of obvious examples is when he uh, pulls out the weapons. You see Cap Shield. Mm -hmm. And Mjolnir really was there too. And you do see Mjolnir as well, there as well, and the Hella, the Hella helmet that he ends up using. It's all there, and so that was that was an interesting call up. But I definitely feel like there's a lot of things missing in there, or a lot of things you can easily miss. Um, I think as the series plays on and people watch it a couple times, I think we'll get some call outs for some Easter eggs that people missed. We also got Cosmo the dog. Cosmo the dog makes a comeback. Love He's getting a spinoff where he fights Crypto, the super dog. It's happening. I'm he, calling it. he should. Um, I mean, I don't know, though. He's a telepathic. He's he, or sorry, he's a telepath. And he actually helps ends up like being a tactician for the Guardians at some point. Oh, um, yeah. Guardians legacy. Uh, that definitely happens. Um, I'm surprised that they still had they had an opportunity. And I'm surprised they didn't do it with this one. They had an opportunity to introduce Nova and they still didn't do it. <laughs> I think that because you gotta you gotta wait for the the live action. I think I think mm. it's for a new character, especially one that I think they want to go places with. I, I'm glad they held off on Nova, um, but they uh, I, I I was really happy to see Karina back. I don't know why. Yes. Just seeing Karina, I was like, oh man, it's Karina. She's back and she's she's got a little bracelet because she she traps the collector. Uh, oh, and speaking of Easter eggs in the collector's arsenal there, when he puts on Hela's helmet, there's a neat little Easter egg there with the weapon he uses. He uses a necro sword, which is the yes. weapon of Gore the God Butcher. That's right. Good call. Yes, that's right. I actually almost missed that. <laughs> but great that was great of you to great of you to pick it up, man. Yes, the necro blade uh, that Gore the God Butcher uses, which the timing of it's quite interesting because set photos have uh, been revealed of what his costume could potentially look like. Ooh. Now of course this is pre editing, but uh it's uh, pretty interesting looking, I will say that. I looked at it, and I I will say I looked at it because again, it's not not gonna look nearly the same once film and editing are all done. Yeah, I think he'll be, I have a feeling Christian's going to be totally unrecognizable. Like, I think he's going to look like an orc. Like, he's going to be buried under layers of makeup and stuff. And, you know, the only mm -hmm. way we'll know he's Christian Bale is every once in a while, he'll be like, you know, oh, good for you, Thor. And then we'll, we'll know it's him. And I think he's going to actually, I think that's pretty accurate to what his accent's going to be like. I'm, I'm, <laughs> 100% sure on that. Um, so, yeah, no, it was that was a good call out, yeah. But I definitely think there's a lot of Easter eggs that we have not seen. And it's going to be really quick. I'm, sh I'm sure it's like a second, split second. But, um, yeah, I'm just it was amazing. And it was really cool to see uh, the uh, the Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive and all those guys. Uh, and uh, they had a more comic booky look look to them. Um and again, though, uh, this is the part of the story I really loved was um, when when T'Challa finds out that his that he he thought his home world was blown to bits and stuff, but he found out it wasn't, and he discovers his ship, which was really cool. Um, I like that. Uh, you know, I kind of like the moment that he had is like, you know, it's about like it's about the home he makes. You know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and his ability to bring, make people feel like they're home. That's, it's, it was such a, I, I'm, I'm probably misinterpreting it a little bit, but it is a powerful moment. It's a powerful message too. Um, but I thought, I thought that moment, that was the moment that really kind of made the, the feel good moment. That I really enjoyed. Yeah, it was a beautiful moment. And I had a moment that wasn't even like, what was going on in the story wasn't even sad. I think they were just like, yeah, let's go, let's go stop, whatever, let's go stop the collector. Uh, but it just, I just got hit with a wave of just like missing Chadwick and just thinking like, oh God, he's, you know, we're not going to get this guy again. And it, it, I got like choked up and it, like, it wasn't even a sad moment. They were just plotting their, their attack on the collector. And it was, 
Oh, man, it, it's it's a real shame. I'm glad we got one more performance out of him. It was very surreal because I, I couldn't remember when they were, you know, making this and announcing this. So I didn't know if we were getting Chadwick or if he had already passed away by, by the time. But so thankfully, he must have recorded this quite a while ago. Uh, but it was really nice to to have to just have another chance at hearing him play T'Challa. Um, and I had a question during this episode and I know I have to apologize in advance Ryan because I know I've asked you this question before on the show and you have answered it and I just can't remember the answer but when the Black Order shows up and Thanos goes to take them on I'm like okay I can't remember for the life of me without the gauntlet or any of the stones what can Thanos do He's just super strong. <laughs> That's okay. really all he can do. He's just a super, super strong uh, individual. the The thing that he, the thing that gives him an advantage is he's a deviant, which is uh, the uh, it is kind of the celestial gods is uh, accident when creating human beings. <laughs> Oopsie. Uh, yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of just like a, the the mistake. Um, but in the end, he still has celestial genes in them so that's why he's able to wield the gauntlets and or wield the stones in order to have the gauntlet and do his thing okay all right yeah because i i was totally i was totally blanking and i'm like okay what can he do does he like can he clap his hands like hulk and like create a shock with like i, I just could not remember what mm-hmm. he does when he's just a guy uh but just just super strong i would say he's like a low level hulk all right that works that works for me Good on you, Thanos, for being a low-level Hulk and still being a good like he guy. could he could stand up to the Hulk. Like that's my point. But he's right. not like he's not like the Hulk in the sense where his strength uh, gets in more intense uh, as as he gets angrier. No, that's not what he does. Right, this is more stable. That's fair. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that was uh, that was my thoughts overall on this episode. It was it was just it was so much fun. It was a beautiful feast for the eyes, and it was a great way to integrate all these characters and just the littlest things like, yes, because Thanos is not an asshole to his children, Nebula has blonde hair. Like it makes sense. Uh, I love all these little butterfly effect pieces. That's Mm. what makes this show great for me. You know, but they, they do do, they do do, uh, Mm -hmm. they do a, uh, a nice epilogue to the story and they do make reference a beautiful, reference uh to what would happen to star lord yeah uh, peter quill star lord uh and i love that ego still ends up finding him and he says that it's bad so uh i wonder uh, what that means but i assume it just means that ego gets what he wants and he ends up dealing some damage exactly if, if ego gets what he wants which we assume he does pretty much everybody's dead Right, the whole universe is just becomes uh, him. You know, actually, come to realize, you know what happens. Um, the story kind of lets you write itself uh, because uh, the mission at uh, Collector was to grab those seeds that that make a planet recover. Right, oh. so they would destroy. They would destroy a lot of life. Yes, but they would have the means to repair said damage. Okay, so there's a little bit of hope there. Um, but that would be a very scary time, you know, in between. Mm. Uh, and I think it's safe to say ego has never looked more frightening than he did in that one little shot. We got him. He was lit, like, I, I backed away from my TV. I was like, Whoa, Whoa. <laughs> like, he looked so, so scary. Uh, and poor Peter Quill is just mopping up at a Dairy Queen uh, yeah. and has never really done anything else with his life that we know of, but he still has his Walkman. Thankfully. Yeah. I'd say so. As Walkman playing his tunes, um, I would say though the collector looked really, uh, you know, cut man. That guy he was, was big. He, he was looked built. like Sabretooth. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, he did. He was a beast of a guy. Uh, but yeah, I I like where the show's going. Um, I have been following the rumors a little bit. Uh, apparently, we are due, we are due for a. Uh, Nick Fury episode that's supposed to be a big game changer moment is what mm-hmm. I'm hearing. But again, guys, as you can see, based on these episodes we've done in the past, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm horribly wrong. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. 
the episode is just what if Nick Fury's other eye was the one that was covered up? <laughs> then what would he see? But then Ooh. you realize both eyes were always open. Ooh, yeah. You know who didn't realize that? Alexander Pierce. Ooh, no, he didn't. A burn, Great Pierce. Yeah. A burn. Uh, speaking of, apparently this is news, uh, real news. But Sam Wilson has been confirmed. And the contract has been finalized that he will be returning as Captain America in Captain America 4. Okay, I'm glad that's all super confirmed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready. We've got 20 movies before that, it looks like. But I'm, I'm ready for I'm always, you know me, I'm always ready to open my arms and welcome a part four of anything. When, when a franchise is confident enough to say, you know what? Trilogies are cool. Actually, let me let me dial this back and do this in the vein of a movie that I know you hated, but I love Wonder Woman 1984. Trilogies are cool, but four is better. <laughs> uh, uh. You know that that was one of the gems that came out of that, and one of probably the only gems that came out of that movie. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we'll see what happens when the wish granting stone falls into my lap. And I start wishing willy nilly for things. Yeah. Uh, so that was what if, uh, and I, we we had to cover the first two because I was uh, working for the first one, unfortunately. And uh, over the course of the next ones, I should probably point out Wednesday nights uh, are nights that I'm usually working, so we may end up having to record our what if podcasts on the following Thursday nights. Uh, so just to let everybody know, you're probably not going to get them as uh, quickly as you did with like Loki and Falcon and Winter Soldier and WandaVision, whatever, just because of that. It just worked out Wednesday nights. Uh, not good for me, Marvel. So uh, what are you, you going to do? You put you put me on the spot, Marvel. All right. I got to be here. You want me to be there? I can't be two places at once. I'm not a nightcrawler, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, also, you know, you need to make money. You know, it's- yeah. That's, I saw that Disney Plus subscription is not paying for itself. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin. Yeah, put me on the spot here. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but yeah, no, but uh, we'll get you guys that content as soon as possible. I will say, though, ladies and gentlemen, we got tickets. We got tickets for Shang-Chi. And uh, we'll be seeing the advanced screening on Thursday, September 2nd, the day before release. Mm-hmm. And uh, what time is the show? You haven't told me that yet. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. So theoretically, Ryan, we could watch Shang-Chi and then we could go back to your apartment and record for the first time in person together. Ooh, yeah, Remember no, that? That, I think that's, I don't think that's, you know, what we should do. I think that's what we will do because <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to. I mean, it's, while well, the information's fresh and the feelings are there, let's, let's ride that train home. Yes. Oh, I can't wait. I can't. It's been it's been so long since Mjolnir held up a microphone and let us talk into it. That has been yeah. so long. And we are seeing it with the full squad, people. We're going with Anna. We're going with Andrew Fantasia. And we're going with me. And we're going with Isabella, keeping it real. <laughs> I'm sure she'll love it. I think she'll actually really like this one, personally. Tell her it's exactly like Snake Eyes, the movie, and she'll love it. <laughs> no. burn isabella burn i know she's in the other room she can't hear me but she knows yeah, probably she knows watching a people. horror movie an equally terrible <laughs> in her mind looked, an equally terrible horror movie equally terrible but she just looked up from the movie and she's like i think i just got burned by andrew i don't know i just <laughs> I felt a disturbance in the force it's so warm all of a sudden <laughs> uh but that is what if and it has been such a pleasure to what if with you ryan the realm of infinite possibilities uh yeah what if guys stay tuned keep on keep hitting that subscribe button and like button and leave those comments because we're going to continue to learn what if and we all know christine everhart is a nihilist so there's no point doing a what if about that there's no point i don't know what a lot you were thinking your head shakes for now your head will bop in in like rhythmic agreement when she shows up with insect wings <laughs> anyway thanks so much everybody thanks for tuning in uh we will see you next time until then have 
a marvelous day. Hey scumbags, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.